one of the video goal projects that is um, Countdown Songs, which Countdown Songs is kind of rapping, kind of japping, kind of like, you know, letting you know with a hoodie and an attitude about how to read the Word of God. <laughs> but I just didn't feel like it, you know, I was like, nah, nah, I don't want to do that. So I was thinking, you know, most men, whether you know this or not, now women know this, but men really don't understand this, but all men know how to be jerks. I mean, it's almost as though we were born with that jerk nature in us. We somehow are jerks first, and we have to learn how to be men second. You know, men, supposedly boys, you know. Most of the time that I look around the world, I see boys acting like men rather than men being all they were intended God to create in them. Because a man is able to handle situations and circumstances irregardless of what they are, who they are, or what the circumstances are. Because a man has learned to turn his life over to God himself. A man is not ruled and regulated by his own self-esteem but rather how God esteems him, because that's what a man means. It's ish, from the word ish in isha, man and woman, that God created, in the beginning God created man for his own good pleasure, actually, the fellowship with him. And so, in order to be a man, really, you have to find what you were created for and then fulfill it. Now, most people are just boys. They're babies and boys, and they have their man caves and their toys, and they play on Harleys and they act like games, you know, and you can tell men from boys because boys play with toys, you know, and they really, even though they may act like, act like men at times, for the most part they're still busy playing with, you know, guns and roses and music and drugs and, you know, all these things juggling them to fulfill their fantasies that they didn't live out or that they think that that's what their life is all about living out what they want rather than doing what God wants because that's what the definition of a man is. A man is someone who was created by God and is in relationship with God. Now if you're not in a relationship with God, well then you're not necessarily a man, you're a child or a creation of Satan because literally that's what's happened is that when the devil came into the world, he kind of took over and said, you know what? I'm going to make men like boys, not the music group. I mean, literally, I'm going to dummy down men so they never fulfill their destiny. They don't become man of God, like Abraham, or like some of the old patriarchs, or like some of the rising up leaders that we are meant and called to be. I'm going to distract them by attracting them to the world. I'm going to get them involved in spending time on themselves focused about themselves so they will only see themselves and not see what God intended for them to be. So, the God of this world has blinded their eyes, literally, and he's blinded their eyes to what they are supposed to be, which is like Jesus. Because you see, when Jesus came, he walked, he talked, he lived, he was tempted, he existed. As I like to tell people, he even pooped. Yes, he pooped. <laughs> he had pooper scoopers. No, well, actually, he just, he, he did his duty, you know, just like everybody else. But God lived in flesh as we are flesh. But he demonstrated what we are supposed to be, what we were meant to be, what we could be if we would give our lives to God, to give them over to our Father, which is in heaven. Now, you could choose to be either, you know, someone who's becoming a son of God and then growing up to become a man of God, or you could be, choose to be a son of Satan, growing up to be a full hellion of Satan. That is your choice. One will get you into heaven, the other will get you into hell. The funny thing is, is being distracted, you don't have to do anything to wind up in hell. Do nothing and you'll go there. But you see, to be a Christian or to be a man, you have to go against the grain because your tendency, 
your natural habit, the things that you normally do, is to be a jerk. No, really. One way or another, you're a jerk. Because somehow, some way, in some way, somehow, some way, in some perspective, in some persona, you have stepped on somebody, you climbed the ladder of success, you jumped on someone, you stomped on someone, you made your way, you annihilated your competition, you acted as though you have no emotions, you've done your business duty, you know, you've done all these things that, quite frankly, have nothing to do with being a man, but have everything to do with being of the world. Now, if you're worldly, I'm sorry, that's not being a man. You could have all the riches in the world, and Jesus said, what shall it profit a man if he gained the whole world and lose his very soul? Because Jesus demonstrated when he came to John the Baptist what a man was. John the Baptist said, wow, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Look at this. Whoa, this is he whom I'm not even worthy to untie his shoes, much less baptize him. And Jesus was baptized of John. Jesus, being God, humbled himself as a servant. Now, most men don't think of themselves as being like servants. They want to be in charge. You see, Jesus kind of didn't like that. He warned us about being like that, about wanting to be in charge and being in control because he didn't want you to be in control. He wanted you to give that back to God because your freedom of choice is if you were given authority, would you use it or use it to lay it down at the feet not just of Jesus, but of God our Father. Because everything that Jesus did, he could have done himself on his own. He was God. He was Son of God. But he thought it not right to be considered equal with God, but lowered himself to be subservient. Even lowered himself beneath the angels. That when God lifted him up, the Father, he would be above the angels again. So I find that interesting, is that a man learns how to be subservient, not in charge and in control. So I don't know about you, but I think, you know, the jerk part is the pride part. And most men that women are attracted to seems like are jerks and full of pride and ego and arrogance. And somehow, some way in these latter days, people have forgotten what a gentleman was what someone who knows who he is, knows where he's going and knows how to get there, acts like. Because I see that in other cultures where they're trained up in the right way that they should be. But sadly in America, the only thing that I see really is what Jesus called Gentile. You see, Jesus said the Gentiles like to exercise lordship over one another. Jesus said the Gentiles seek after all these things. Jesus said the Gentiles are worried about man-made or worried about business or worried about these ethics and ethos rather than living out what Jesus said. So if you look at the word Gentile in the Bible, I don't know what you want to do about that, but frankly, that's what Americans are, Gentiles. They aren't acting like children of God. They don't have that love for the brethren as much as Jesus said. They don't have that love for the world as much as God said to have. They don't lay down their life to save their enemies. They lay down their lives to protect their country. They choose to serve and kill rather than be killed and bring about redemption as Jesus did. Because you see, the death of a saint, the death of a soul that lays down his life to follow God's will, will bring about salvation. If you don't believe me, look look at a book called Through the Gates of Splendor, you know, about um, written by Elizabeth Elliot about Jim Elliot, her husband. He went to, in modern days, gave up a promising career, went into ministry, you know, and went on to become a missionary and went down to the Aki Indians, you know, and I think it's in Ecuador. And choosing to bring the gospel to them he wound up so passionate about wanting to serve God that he wound up getting killed in the name of Jesus as he sought to minister to an unreached people. And they killed him for it. End of story. Right?
precious in the sight of God is the death of his saints. Within a generation of his death, not only did his wife affect a whole generation of people by writing books about serving in the missionary field, but likewise, people came back to the same place where Jim Elliot died and witnessed to the people and caused that unreached people to not only be saved, to save many generations after that. You know, I I get goosebumps. I start crying. I think about all these, you know, we just went to a Memorial Day where people say, oh, well, the great heroes of the Bible, you know, forget them. We have heroes that lay down their life, you know, for their country. Oh, God bless the serviceman who dies for his country. Never mind that he killed in the name of whatever, because if he wasn't a Christian, he did it as a waste of time. He could have saved a soul from hell, but instead he chose to send one to hell instead. And I don't want that kind of blood on my hands. I mean, God bless people who serve the country, but you know what? I would rather that man stand up and say, no, in the name of God, I will not kill a soul, but I will save one from hell itself. So for me, you know, you want to see me cry, you want to see me get goosebumps, you want to see me hit tears in my eyes, then talk about the martyrs of today who lay down their lives for those that are unsaved. If you want to see me get oh, humble beyond belief, show me a man who walked away, like the Tim Tebow did, walks away from a football career, goes into ministry, takes with him a lot of people to go do the same. Because you see, it's easy to do ministry when it doesn't cost you anything, when it's just, oh, it's part of my fame and fortune. Right. But when it costs you your life, precious in the sight of God are the death of the saints. No offense, but on Memorial Day, we aren't talking about saints. We're talking about sinners who died for their country. Now, God bless those men who, knowing that they were going to serve their country, went and laid down their life to follow Jesus. And I pray that their sacrifice may have meant something in heaven, because it probably did not. For the majority of those who died in wars, it's a waste of a human soul. It's a waste of a human life. It actually serves the God of this world more than it serves our God, our Father in Heaven. Because Jesus said something different about what we should do with our enemies. It wasn't about protecting ourselves. God's got that covered. It wasn't about providing for ourselves. God's got that covered. It wasn't about protecting our loved ones. God's got that covered. As a matter of fact, everything that you could probably lay out there by saying we have to do something ourselves by picking up our guns or protecting ourselves, God's got covered. Because you see, we're living in eternity once we're saved. We are living in eternity. And if you can't accept the fact that God's protecting you, you aren't living in eternity, you're living in a fantasy world because you really don't know that death has no power over you and there is no sting to death. So you living in this world are a contradiction to the world in its ways because the world says, oh, you've got to protect what's your own. You've got to have what you want. You've got to go out and get. You've got to think positive. You've got to do this and do that. But in reality, Jesus didn't do what most men think they ought to do. So you see, I have an issue sometimes with men because I know I'm a jerk. I like to remind people that they're jerks, that they're idiots, that they're stupid, that they're dumb, because I know I am. I know how I ought to be. I know how I should be. I know what I want to be. But the sad part is I don't see people going in the right direction anymore as much as they're going in the wrong direction. And for me, that kind of breaks my heart. The fruit of the Spirit is long-suffering, gentleness, 
the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. Walk worthy of the vocation wherein you were called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long-suffering forbearing one another in love. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Jesus' sake, has forgiven you. The wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Love suffers long and is kind. In due season we shall reap if we faint not. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waited for the precious fruit of the earth and has long patience for it until he receives the early and latter rain. Be you also patient and establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord draws nigh. Knowing that Jesus is coming, I often ask men, what manner of man ought you to be? Which way have you chosen to go? And most of them will tell me they will provide for their wives or they'll provide for this, that, or the other thing, and they wind up down the road in divorce. And I understand circumstances. I understand challenges. I understand those things. But knowing that Jesus is coming, don't you think you ought to stay where you are, stick with where you're at, do what you're supposed to do as a man instead of acting like a child? Isn't it time to give up being children of Satan and become the man of God? He wants you to be.